Father, I pray that for the next uh, 30 minutes or so that there would be no distractions, that you would help us to hear your voice in the middle of this man, me, trying to communicate um, what you have communicated to us through your word. Open our eyes to hear you. Open our eyes to see you, Jesus. We thank you for your, for your, uh, your redemption, your forgiveness on the cross. I pray that whatever I have to say that it's from you, whatever is not from you, Father, help me to not say it, or at least for people to not hear or remember it. Because Jesus, in this day, with all these different voices and all this, these, these different uh, assertions to what is true and what is right, um, we need to hear yours, you who is the truth. So I pray for to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat, please. Um, if you'd like to turn into 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You guys are having a great day. I have loved summer. Oh my gosh, the sun. Although it is now every day getting darker, so that's a little sad. We're past the summer solstice thing. What was that last Friday? Oh. All right, First Corinthians 13. Um, Christianity is not about rules. It's not about rules. I know we sometimes think that way. I know that I think in popular culture, that's how it's presented, about to-do lists. But Christianity is not about rules. The grand story of the Bible begins with humanity in right relationship with God. And then they blow it, and they're broken, and that whole relationship is, is ruined and then from there forward is this long story of humanity trying to claw its way back into a right relationship with God and never succeeding. As much as we try to be right with God, we just always seem to fall short of Him. We can't do it. No one's perfect is the line we use in our society. And that's absolutely true. No one is perfect, right? But but the good news of, of of the Bible is that in Jesus, all the rules are done. It's done. That by faith you are restored into a right relationship. So what do we do with these rules that are in the Bible? Because there are lots of lists in the Bible, and here's one of them, of how you should live your life. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, and in kind of a reminder, is part of it is remembering that you're right with God apart from what you do. You're right with God because of what He's done for you and your trust in that. That it says that by the work of Jesus' perfect life and His death and resurrection for you, you're trusting that only that you have been made right. And now that that God has showered all of these blessings on you as we read at the beginning of the, so of, of the service today, that every blessing in the heavenlies is yours. Now that you have that, how do you want to live? Now that you have a relationship restored to God where He is going to love you whether you do right or whether you do wrong, you are right with Him because you're His child. I love my children even if they're bad or good. I may respond differently to them depending on how they're acting, but they're always my children. And that's what we are in Jesus. But now that you're that, how do you want to live? You want to please Him, right? How do we approach these to-do lists? By remembering that even if you never live up to them, you're still His. And so we come to this passage of love. And Christians often get the correct, I think, knock that we're not very loving. 
because we don't love very well. We don't live like Jesus very well. And so we come to these texts and these, and one of the reasons for them is to help us grow up to be like Jesus. Not that that secures your relationship with God, but because you have that relationship. Because you want to grow up to be like your dad. You want to grow up to be like your heavenly father. You want to grow up to be like your big brother Jesus. You, you, you want that. And so we come to these pa- to, to places like this where it says, verse 4, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. Or resentful. And we're going to pause here because those, are the, those last two are the ones we're going to talk about today. The list go on. What does it mean to love? We've talked about multiple ones of these. And, and the first thing, I, as, I, as I reminded us when we began to look at this, is you always need to look at all of these things in the context is that people are, are bad. People aren't good, are they? That the context of this, even in this whole, this whole passage, you know, we think of it as a wedding passage, but it actually has nothing to do with weddings. It has to do with this church who is a mess. Lots of people arguing, lots of people fighting, lots of people in division with each other. And what is Paul's general solution? Hey guys, love each other. This is the crowning moment of the whole thing that he keeps coming back to and he's been building up to. You just need to love each other. And so we need to remember as we look through those that the issue here is that it's not whether or not the person that you need to love is worthy of that love. It's how are you going to love them when they're not nice to you, when they're mean, when they're jerks, when they're thoughtless, when they hurt you. How should you love them in this moment? Because that's how God has loved you. Remember that big scheme? God loved you to send Jesus even though you are not right. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 8. That God demonstrates his love for us while we are still sinners. Christ died for you. While you're still messed up, when you still don't please him, that's in the moment where Jesus' love, God's love for you, most shines. And so as we look through there, we need to see it in that context. And the first two were patience and kindness. Patience is delay. It's drawing out your response. When someone does something that's offensive to you, that's hurtful to you, that's wrong, it, being patient is to say, I'm going to wait a moment before I respond. I'm going to just, just, just stop for a second. And it might be 30 seconds. It might be 30 days. You're going to delay. You're going to wait a moment. And it gives you a couple of good things. When you delay, when you actively choose to not immediately respond, a couple of things. It could say, maybe what you'll do is realize, oh, I was wrong and not them. You ever had that when you're in an argument with somebody and you get all ticked off because they did something that you think is wrong and then you walk away for a moment and you go, oh, no, I was wrong. I do that all the time. Or it might mean that you're going to, you're going to give them room to go, hey, I was wrong. I'm sorry I hurt you. It allows them to give them space for them to go, I was wrong. And to, for them to initiate the things and say, hey, I, I, I shouldn't have been right. I wasn't right. It, it, the Bible puts it this way. It describes it as being repenting. It's coming back to you and said, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. And if that doesn't happen, it still gives you a way to, when you do come back to them and say, this was not right, you can at least do it in a far more measured, controlled way and not snap at them. Then maybe that will lead them back to repentance. There's so many good ways for delaying, and that's what patience is all about. It's delay, it's waiting, it's drawing out, responding, responding to their wrong. But then there's, the, there's kindness, and kindness is such a great core thought here to love. It's being good to people who aren't good to you. 
It's showering on them goodness. Meeting their needs and their wants and their desires. You want to make them happy. That's what kindness does. Matthew 44, 45 talks about this and how God is good to good people and to bad people. But I tell you, love your enemies, Jesus said. Pray for those who persecute you, those who are not nice to you at all, so that you may be sons of the Father in heaven. For he cares, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The people who are not nice to God, he is still doing good to them. It doesn't justify their actions. It doesn't endorse what they're doing. He's being kind to all people. Apart from their worthiness of it. It's, the, it's being nice to your spouse when they were just mean to you. It doesn't endorse it. But it sure is like your father. And so I, I, I used the phrase a couple of weeks ago with this, you know, you make the cake. Doesn't mean you endorse the action of the person that is, you're baking that cake for. What it means is, is you're being like your father in heaven. And again, it might draw them into repentance. What Romans 2, 4 says, that God's patience, God's kindness leads people to repentance. Do you presume on the riches, the kindness, the patience or forbearance, and not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead people to repentance? It's You do good to them, even when they're not nice to you, and maybe they'll stop and go, why are you being so nice to me? This is what kindness does. And why these things aren't loving, why, why it's lo well, these two things are loving is because it, it's all about preserving the relationship, bringing people together. And what it, nor, what it looks like in regular life is Romans 12, 19, and 20, 19 through 21. Beloved, never avenge yourself. Don't. Don't immediately respond. Allow God to potentially bring the, the justice. You don't have to. Let do God do that. Patience. Verse 20. Instead, be kind. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, do, give him something to drink. And if he never repents, then God will, God will decide. God might, will, will decide whether or not he deserves more judgment because you've been kind to him in spite of it. That's his call. Be kind. Which led us to, to the next two. Envy or boasts. These two are all about being unhappy or causing someone to be unhappy with their circumstance. Envy is all about when you get something good, I'm not happy about it. Ever play a, a a card game or a board game or something like that, and somebody else wins and you are not happy about it? That's envy. It literally means to be in pain in your heart because somebody else wins. That's envy. You want it instead of them. It's envy. And you would think that's not a big deal. What Envy, come on. Does that really deserve to be on this list of sin? This list of things that, it's hateful. Envy kills people. Whether we were talking about Cain and Abel, where we're talking about Joseph in Genesis 37, where we're talking about Jesus. Jesus was killed because of envy. I want to take what they have, which ultimately leads, means taking their life. Now, it rarely gets to that point, but it go, that's the road it goes down. And bragging? Bragging is making yourself look good. And you think that's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, it is, because it inflames envy. It's the whole point of bragging. It's to make you go, oh, I wish I had what he had. That's what you're trying to do with bragging. And it takes on so many different forms. And it can be as blunt and straightforward of simply stating the facts I am, in fact, smarter than you. 
Well, it's true. I mean, I got the IQ test to prove it. So I'm just telling you the way it is. But it's still bragging. Or it could be subtle, like, you know, I, I just, just want to help you with your, you know, with your children. You know, my children was able to walk at seven months. You know, if you do this, yours can be. You see, you're helping, but you're really bragging about how you're, you're a better parent. There's so many ways that we, in so many subtle ways, that we brag. And the distinction is, is are you trying to make yourself look better at the expense of somebody else? It's a hard issue. And the next one of arrogance, it doesn't just simply say that you're arrogant, you're, you're better than them. You actually believe you're better. You actually believe you're actually better than other people. And how do you know if you're having a struggle with that? Ever think uh, that you have, a you have a hard time getting it, taking advice from other people? Suggestions? Or maybe things like, well, I would never do that. I would never be one of those people. That's arrogance. And neither, none of these things are, are loving because it's, it's all about you. That you're actually better than them. It's not loving at all. Which leads us to the next two, very briefly. This rude and insist on your own way. We talked about that last week. And you think, why would rude be on this list? Doesn't that seem like really small potatoes? But it's that, It's huge. Because what Rude fundamentally does says, I don't care what you think. I don't care if I offend or hurt you. It doesn't matter to me. And that's the opposite of love. Love says, you matter to me. And the crazy thing about Rude, the thing that's difficult to wrap our heads around, is unlike many things in this list, the culture you're in determines how it's lived out. What is rude in America is not the same thing that's rude in Iran. There are different social norms. There's different social norms in Mexico than there is here. If you're late in the Philippines, they don't care. But if you're late here, that's offensive and rude. You go, to, the, you, you go to, to East Asia, they don't care if you cut in line. That's not their culture. Here, that's deeply offensive. It's all about how this plays out. My dear people, you have to bow to a certain extent to the social norms of the culture you're in. So that you don't unnecessarily offend. The gospel is offensive enough saying that you can't do it on your own. You need Jesus. And so why is it? Why, why is it and, it? and if you won't bow to the, to the norms of your society, essentially what you're doing is the next one. You're insisting on your way. You're deciding that I don't care what you want. I want what I want. And both are deeply self-centered. Be mannerly, is what he's saying. Be courteous. That's loving. Be concerned about what they look like. Be respectful. Offer your seat to someone who's older than you. That's mannerly in our society. In fact, in most societies, it is. Leading us finally to the next and these last two for today. Another one that, you know, rude doesn't seem to be a big deal, but how about this one? Irritable? Is that really sinful? Irritable and resentful. What is irritable? I almost don't need to define it because it's such an obvious th thing, isn't it? It's being grouchy. What is it? Annoyed, easily annoyed, grumpy. Easily frustrated at the people around you. 
prone to snapping at someone. Is that really sinful? It's a form of, of not loving. You could say it's hateful to not to be grouchy, irritable. It's a type of anger. It's not loving for this reason. It damages relationships. Have you ever been around someone who's grouchy very much? How is that relationship going? Neurologists have actually studied someone who's being grouchy. And it's interesting, it burns little black holes in your brain when you do it. It creates black holes. And that's a great illustration for what happens. It, it, it creates a distance between you and another person. It damages you and it damages that relationship. It's not patient. It's not p compassionate. It's not gracious. And resentful is similar. Resentful is dwelling on something that, that offended or hurt you. A wrong done to you and you just dwell on it and you hold on to it. It's also a form of anger. But unlike anger, we think, we think of anger as just this either on or off switch. We think of this as anger as pounding and throwing stuff. And that is all anger. But sometimes what anger does is it cools. And it crystallizes into something cold and hard. That's resentment. And it's like a big black hole between you and another person. You dwell on this thing and you just, it just creates these deep, dark, not wanting to connect with another person. They hurt you and you keep playing that back and forth in your head. You may not even articulate it to yourself, but you'll do things like, they say things like, they always dot, dot, dot. Remember when you dot, dot, dot. It's bitter. It's, it's deep, this deep, unresolved anger over something. A wrong that's done to you. It's not for, you never really forget it. Never really. You may even say, oh, I forgive them. But there's no resolution to the issue. Causing you to perhaps be passive-aggressive against them. It's subtle ways of being contrary to them. One, com one uh, I think it was Nelson Mandela, described it this way. It's like e eating poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> because you want them to die, you're angry at them. But here's what it actually does to you. It hurts you. As all unforgiveness does, as all anger does, you might hurt people, and anger always hurts somebody. But this particularly thing, it hurts you. And that's why it's so bad. It not just hurts them and destroys that relationship, it hurts you. As does envy, as does arrogance, as does rude, all of this hurts you. And so, what's the reason for it? Now, there's a lot of different reasons for things like irritability, and we have to be honest with that. Sometimes, there's really good reasons for it. But, there, but a lot of the good reasons can actually be easily solved or relatively do things about it. Things like stress and anxiety can cause you to be irritable. Things like being in pain or depressed or having physical ailments. There's lots of reasons why you are not physically or mentally okay that will cause you to get irritable. But they're fixable. I hate to say it, but like, have less coffee. I love coffee. But I've gotten irritable lately. So I was recommended to have less. And my irritability has gotten better. Amazing. Reduce the stress. Exercise. Get sleep. Have you ever noticed you get grumpy when you get sleep? When you're, you're, you don't get enough sleep? 
There's things you can do. And resentful? Resentful is the irritability that's gone to seed, that's hardened. But what both of these have in, pr- in, 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 in connection is anger. And both of them have unforgiveness in common. So let's talk about that for a moment, just for a moment. Anger, you need to understand, can be okay. God gave you anger, and there are things worthy of getting angry at. Anger is not bad. God gets angry. But it needs to be slow. It needs to be in control. It doesn't, when, when, when we get angry, you need to be patient so that you have that moment of stepping back and not just simply reacting. You can slow down and think about how do you want to re- respond to this. He needs to be slow. God is slow to anger. You need to be slow to anger. James 1.19 puts it this way. James 1.19. My dear bro- loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, but slow to speak and slow to anger. Be slow in your anger, not quick. Because God is not irritable. You understand your father is not irritable. He's not annoyed with you. God does not get annoyed with people. God does not get frustrated with people. God does not get annoyed with you. Does he get angry? Yes. Exodus 34, 6, I don't think I have the slide for that, but Exodus 34, 6 says that God is slow to anger. Is there a time and place for anger? Absolutely. And God does have anger, but it's slow. You need to be slow. I have to practice patience. Do not be angry, but, but don't sin in that anger by speaking faster than you should and forgiveness is the key to both to all of this it's really the solution how does god forgive you well he forgives you on the cross colossians 2 13 and 14 god in verse 14 he erased this certificate of death with its obligation that it was against us, opposed to us, taking it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Jesus on the cross took all the lists of all the stuff that God has recorded that you've done wrong, and he took it and he nailed it on the cross, removing it. There's no longer a list of your good or bad deeds, your bad deeds. It's gone. He paid the penalty for you. So that as Hebrews 12 puts eight, 12 says, he doesn't remember your sins anymore. I will be merciful to their wrongdoing, and I will remember their sins no more. Now that's the problem, though. What does it mean to, forget, to, to not remember sins? I get the fact that, that God paid the penalty. He, he absorbed the, the, the pain of your sin. And, but then he says he doesn't remember. What does it mean to remember, and this is one of the problems. What does forgiveness mean? Does it mean I get to have to trust them again? No. There's no feelings to it, and it doesn't mean that you have to trust them again. Forgive cancels the, the debt. It means that you no longer are going to rep- pay them back for what they did to you. You no longer take it personal that they did that to you. But it doesn't mean that you ignore that they did it. It just means that you don't, you don't have to pay them back for it. Just because someone stole something from you doesn't mean I'm going to offer them to steal something else from me. I'm just not going to require them going to jail for it. If I did want them to go to jail, it's because I want them to, to help them with it. Not out of anger, out of retribution. It's going back to that Romans 12. I'm going to leave room for God to bring judgment. I don't need to do it. Forgiveness just brings them back to zero. It doesn't mean that you necessarily trust them again. You're letting, you let go. you got to let go. 
Some of us have held on to hurts for a long time. Things that they've said, things that people have done. And my dear people, if that's you, it's you who are in prison, not them. You're the one that swallowed the poison. You're not killing them. You're killing you. It's not worth it. And it continues to create this irritability, this snapping and ruining your relationships, often with not just the person that you're angry at, but everybody else. This is what unforgiveness and anger, unresolved anger will do to you. You got to let it go. And they may never say, I'm sorry. And that's what you will have to live with to set yourself free from it. How does, and how, how can you do that? You need to remember that this is how God acts towards you, my dear people. Because you and I both sin far more than you and I know. And how many times have you, conf have you confessed that you were rude as a sin? I gotta, th I, I gotta be honest, I've rarely confessed rudeness as sinful. Irritability as sinful. And yet my Father has forgiven this. Just like you. Are you irritable? You know how you can find out? Ask your spouse. And if they're honest, they'll tell you. Or your children. Or your grandchildren. They'll tell you. Wonderful thing about little kids is they have no sense of sugarcoating things. Are you grumpy? Ask. They'll tell you. Are you resentful? Is there a bitterness in your heart? You got to let it go. And the response needs to be C-A-T. I've said this before, and let me remind you again. And with this, we'll wrap up. You begin by confessing what you've done. You got to get specific. You got to get detailed. You got to say exactly what and when and who you've done it to. None of this job, I'm generally, I'm, I'm rude. No, 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 no. I was rude on this day at this time to this person saying this thing. Because then you're actually owning it. You're really realizing what you've actually done and how you've hurt people with your sin, with your anger unresolved. Be detailed with it. Realize what it is. And then, you conf and then once you've confessed, you've got to say, thank you, Jesus. You see, if you really are not determined, your relationship with your God is not fundamentally determined by your actions, but by faith in Jesus, then the response needs to be thank you. Because 1 John 1, 9 tells you if you confess, he will forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive. See, we've got to get off that treadmill of saying, I've got I, I to gotta perform well, I've got to perform well. No, you do not need to perform well. You need to trust. And then, once you realize that God is treating you this way, then you can finally free yourself from thinking about yourself so darn much that you can start thinking about other people. Because as long as you're on this treadmill of, I've got to be good, I've got to be good, I've got to be good, all you're thinking about is you. Stop thinking about you. And think about Him. And say, thank you that you've forgiven me. Thank you that... that that you treat me like this, that you cover over my sins, that you don't beat me up every single time I do something that is worthy of annoying you, worthy of irritating you, Father. You just simply say, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. I'm yours. Thank you. And then ask to be changed. And some of, the, some of the asking needs to be things like, 
God, help me to do the practical steps I need to do to help, so I'm less grumpy with people, like going to bed earlier. Put your phone down. Read a book before going to bed. Do something to actually get better sleep because that is a way of saying, I love you to the people around you. Reduce the stress. Maybe you need to exercise more. Maybe you have a little less coffee. Ugh, it's hard to say. Um, do things that you know that are in your power that you can make yourself less irritable. And then let those stuff go that are holding on to you so that you can love like Jesus loves you. Love like your Father loves you. Let's pray.